Welcome to both of you in here, uh, Ken Follett over there in England and uh, Espen Hansen also here in the studio with me. And congrats, big congrats to you both with this uh, Mufibo Award, which is for uh, audiobook of uh, the evening and the morning. And Ken, I would like to tell you that 30,000 Danes have actually actively voted for this prize. Wow. So... Uh, it's good. And I want to show you actually how what it looks like. Can you see it here? Oh, yeah. Can you see what it is? Well, it looks like one of those weights that I lift in my <laughs> <Yes. laughs> It's a It would be a little sharp for that, though, but it's a sound wave, if you can imagine oh, that. Okay, I get it, yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, and very good. So, and this one in the studio is uh, Espen's, actually. So Espen, here to you. And uh, because, wow. Ken, yours is on its way. Thank you. It will come, and it's heavy, so you can use it as a weight when it comes. <laughs> so, are you actually uh, an audiobook listener yourself? Yes, I, I, I listen in the car, although for the past year I haven't driven my car very much because we can't go anywhere. Mm. But normally I listen in the car. And, right. and uh, uh, sometimes uh, I like to listen to books in French because it helps me learn the language. Uh -huh. And sometimes I listen to my own books uh, to uh, remind me and to find out how how well the reader has done. And I have to say, it's a thrill uh, to have talented people like Esben read my stories. You know, sometimes people ask me, why don't you read the book yourself? And the answer is because I can't do it as well <laughs> as the professionals. And I just love to hear the way they do different voices and different accents and they put the emotion into the story. Uh, and, um, you know, I think our customers are getting really good value for money because <clears throat> they get my story. <laughs> and they get Esben's talent. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's Thank brilliant. You. Do you have actually a say in the in the voices chosen in the different languages? Uh, and say if you heard Esben's, and are you are you having the vote to say yes or no to a no, reader? I no, I don't. Um, uh, I'm not really qualified to judge. I leave that to the publishers. You know, the publishers know a range of people. Uh, and they had to decide whether it will be a male or a female voice. And uh, I, I don't interfere with that. Um, you know, it's tempting. But on the other hand, it's really better if I concentrate on what I do really well, which is write the books mm. and, and leave, the, uh, leave, leave the other things to other experts. <laughs> and the uh, expert uh, here to you, Espen, mm. uh, who has read. Uh, actually, the, this is the fourth a Ken Follett novel that you have read yeah. as audiobook. Yeah. Uh, what's the what's the challenges of of uh, reading a Ken Follett book? Oh, they are very very long, <laughs> <laughs> long books. No, <laughs> um, I was very lucky in two thousand and seven to be asked if if I wanted to narrate uh, the Pillars of the Earth, uh, and then it was uh, almost natural that I had. Uh, then the following and the following and now th this one also and I'm I'm very um, honored uh, to have had these uh, 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 jobs yeah how long does it because I, uh, the audiobook in Danish is 29 hours yeah so I've been listening to your voice in my ears for many hours yeah. now yeah you know how long does it take for you to read the, uh, t t including the breaks that I need and the preparation and so on, it's it's about uh, two and a half hours for one hours uh, recorded. Wow, uh, something like that. And and I'm I'm uh, I can read um, I can do two hours a day, which means five six hours of work, uh, and then my voice and my concentration uh, capacities uh, have have um, reached the limit for that day. How do you prepare? Uh, for, uh, do you, do you mm. read the book first or what? No, uh, I did in the beginning, uh, but I didn't with uh, these 900 or something pages of Pillars of the Earth. So uh, I read um, 
maybe a hundred pages. Uh, and today I read a couple of hours in maybe one hour. Uh, and if I feel at home very uh, quickly, then I start doing uh, uh, the audiobook. Uh, right. And then I get surprises. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> different names, different places. Uh, and then I have to check and, and find out. So I do a lot of stops. Yeah, Espan, just before we went on, Ken was talking about uh, he had a very difficult part about all the the names of French streets in Paris. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that was uh, a, a column of fire. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you walk a lot of streets in in Paris in yeah. that one. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about work methods, can uh, uh, Esten tells here that he can work like two days, uh, uh, two hours a day. How how many hours do you write, and do you write every day? Well, in, in fairness, Esben didn't say that he only works two hours a day. No. He says he works all day to produce two hours of, oh, right, right, of, yeah, of the yeah. audio book. Sorry, yeah. Thank you. He's, uh, he, uh, and um, uh, I, I, I work all day. You know, um, a book like um, The Evening and the Morning takes me just about three years to write. And yeah. if, I only, if, if I only worked a couple of hours a day, it would take me 10 years. <laughs> uh, you know, it's uh, I work all day um, and it's still taking me three years to finish a book. So it's because the books are long, of course, uh, or at least that's one of the reasons. It's also because I'm kind of a perfectionist and I rewrite a lot. But, uh, yeah, I I I work all day. And if the pressure's on, you know, if I have a deadline and I'm running a little late, then I work Saturdays and Sundays as well. People say to me, um, um, why do you work all the time? You're a millionaire. You could retire. And I say, what the heck would I do? <laughs> so it's uh, you. You're both very disciplined, but you're also doing it out of um, want, or uh, you know, because you 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 find it fun. Absolutely, and and um, and I kind of don't like to stop. So when I finish something, you know, I've just. Uh, I've just finished a, a book that's being published in November, uh, and, um, uh, and and for a couple of days I didn't do anything, and then I started thinking about what to write next. I really, <laughs> I really. People say, people say to me, I suppose when you finish a book, you take six months holiday. No, I couldn't take. I find it difficult to say, take six days holiday. You know. <laughs> Well, we, we readers are happy that you are so busy and so hardworking. And uh, talking about audio books, um, for for narrators as you, Espen, it's always a balance of how much acting you should do in in the lines in the book. Yeah. You know, what what is your uh, approach to that? How much acting do you do, and mm. or and why not if not doing much? Mm. I um, I don't think that I'm acting very much. Uh, of course, it's. Uh, you should be able to to uh, to hear whether it's a woman or a man or a, an old man or a, a young boy or whatever. But but um, uh, I think that British uh, uh, English audiobooks are more acted, a little more than than Danish. Mm -hmm. uh, but Danish narrators are very different in in how they do it. Um, I try to be reliable, as reliable as possible, and I try to, to read it as if I had uh, been been uh, writing it. Um, uh, yeah, in in respect for the for the text. Yeah, I think the 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 biggest compliment I ever had was from an author who said, "You don't stand in the way." Hmm. Um, yeah, and I right. was very happy about that. Interesting. That's good. Mm. And uh, well, what do you think, Ken? Is it uh, when you hear your own books being narrated? Is it? Uh, do you like that the narrators act the lines you have written? Yes. Yes, I think it's wonderful. I think it enhances the experience for the listener enormously. And um, you know, I I had a great friend. He's dead now. Uh, um, uh, who who was an actor who used to do who used to do occasional books of actor called Alan Rickman. Oh yes. Was a friend of mine. Yeah. And, um, I, I once in a, in a store, I saw that he had read a Thomas Hardy book. Um, I think it was the return of the native and, um, all of that, 
that book all takes place in a particular county of England where they have a particular accent. And but what I noticed listening was that each major character had a different version of this local accent. Wow. I thought that was amazing. You know, not only as Epson said, you have to be able to tell whether it's a man or a woman speaking, mm. but all these people had very similar accents. But but with Alan, you could tell who were the upper class people and who were the middle class people, who were the farming type people. They all yeah. had. I said to him, how did you do that? Mm. <laughs> he said, I, ha I went through the script and I had different colors. Mm -hmm. And I just marked each line of dialogue with the correct color for the accent that I had to use. And uh, and I guess, you know, I mean, it seems amazing to me, I guess, if you're a talented, if you have that talent, as Alan did and as Esben obviously has, then I guess you can do it. But I must say it, it the skill amazes me. And uh, Alan Rick is also known as Dr. Snape in the Harry exactly. Potter novels, for those people who <laughs> might not know yes. <laughs> who the Harry he is. Potter movies. Yes, 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 exactly. So so this uh, the Danish version of uh, The Evening and the Morning uh, takes uh, 29 hours to, to listen to. And uh, uh, I, after having listened to it, I feel I like know both of you <laughs> because mm -hmm. I've had it for so many hours now. But Ken, for you, of course, it has taken much longer than 29 hours uh, to, to write this book, uh, more than more uh, like three years, as you mentioned before. And this is a pre prequel to Pillars of the Earth. Why did you want to go back to Nightbridge in year 997, way before the story we know from Pillars of the Earth? You know, when Knightsbridge was just a river and a few scattered houses. Well, two reasons. One, this is a very exciting period in history. The year 1000, round about the year 1000 is a turning point. It's the end of the Dark Ages and uh, the beginning of the Middle Ages. The Dark Ages were a time of stagnation, no progress. And the Middle Ages represent the rebirth of European civilization after 500 years of the Dark Ages. So it's an exciting time. And of course, whenever there's change, there's conflict and conflict is what stories are made of. The other thing is at that moment, there were three powerful groups of people competing for control of England. And there were the Anglo-Saxons, of course, the Normans across the channel in northern France and those terrible people, the Danes, <laughs> uh, who in those days were called mm. Vikings. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they also wanted control of England and they were very fierce and very savage. And, um, you know, sometimes I, I talk to Danish people about the Vikings in my story and they say, you know, you know, we're really not like that anymore. I, I say, boy, I know. <laughs> I really know. Um, it, wouldn't it be terrible if the Danes were still like that, sailing all over the world and killing people? Um, so, so, so that was that's a, a three-way contest for control of England, and that makes that gives me as a storyteller lots of opportunities. That was one reason, but the other was that. Uh, Esben will know, I'm sure, talking to to people who listen to the audio books, uh, that, that the readers are interested in Kingsbridge. They know about Kingsbridge. This is the fourth novel that they've read about this little town. Mm. And they remember, you know, that there's a river and a hill and a church on top of the hill and, uh, and um, an and island. Yes, an island in the middle. That's right. And and there's a there's a field called Lovers Field, and you can guess what the what that's used for. And uh, people know all this, and they're kind of interested. And and so quite a lot of readers, uh, I felt, would be interested to know what this place was like before before it was a big important city with a cathedral and a marketplace. What was it like before? I thought they'd be into and I was intrigued also to tell that story. How does a little village become a big town? When that kind of thing happens, progress, there is again always conflict. Some there are people who say, yes, yes, we should have progress. We should have 
a cathedral and a marketplace and a bridge. And there are other people who say, no, no, let's live everything as it is. Why change it? We don't want change. We don't want new people coming here. We like it the way it is. And that's a, a conflict. Um, modern readers will recognize that conflict as something that goes on in their own countries and in their own cities today. So I figured what with that small conflict in the in the village and the big conflict in the country over who was going to rule the country. I looked at that and, and I, I, I felt sure I could make a good story out of that. You certainly did. And uh, the story evolves around these uh, three main characters, uh, 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 the noblewoman Ragnar and the boat builder Edgar and the bishop Winston. How, and they're from different classes, and I'm sure that's intentional uh, for you, Ken. Um, how do you go about building these characters? How do they, do they, do, does, did it start with just one and then suddenly the other popped up? Or how did you, how did you create them? It really starts with a story. Um, and in the, for example, in the case of Ragnar, uh, I read in the history books about a real woman, uh, nor, uh, like Ragnar, a Norman princess who came to England to marry somebody she'd never met. And uh, so I thought I thought that was a great story, just just on its own. The real mm. life woman was called Emma of Normandy, and she came to England to marry the King of England. And when she arrived, she discovered that he already had a wife. Mm -hmm. And that, I, th I thought, bang, I can just see that story. Uh, and it's a tremendously dramatic moment. But it happened in real life. So I decided to write a story about it. And then I thought, okay, what kind of woman is this? Who does this? She's probably, she's got to be quite brave. She goes to another country to marry this man. She's never been to England. She doesn't know anything about his family. And when and then what happens when she gets there and discovers that things are not what she expected? Well, then I decided that she would be tough and she wouldn't she wouldn't go crying home to her mother and say it's awful it's awful. She would stay there and work it out. So that so the character of Ragnar really grew out of me thinking about her situation, what the story is, and how best to tell that story. And that happens, you know, with a lot of with most of my characters in popular literature. The story has to be really strong. Mm. You can't write a popular novel that just investigates the psychology of a few individuals. There have to be events. In a popular novel, people have to make decisions that change their fate. That's what interests us. And the characters grow out of that situation. Mm. That's very interesting. Uh, Espen, I would like to know, do you grow a certain sympathies for, for certain characters? Certainly. While you're reading? Yeah, certainly. Certainly. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you like some, uh, one, some of them more than others? <laughs> sure. Sure. And uh, I remember in almost every, yeah, all all four four books here. There's a time where I'm thinking, so why don't you kill that bastard? <laughs> you know, so, so so that we can move on and people can live more peacefully. <laughs> kill that bastard, and and sometimes he is killed, uh, but it takes a while uh, sometimes before yeah <laughs> before it succeeds. Yeah, sure, I sympathize with them. Um, with the main characters. Right, you're not just being objective while reading. No, no, That's, no, I'm no. glad to hear no, that. No, no, no. <laughs> so, can you, your book or books always seem to give a glimpse of how, in his glimpse back in history of how life was back then, and it feels real, <laughs> you know, uh, even though I know it's fictional. Um, but you do a lot of research for it into Viking ships or into the tapestry of Bajou. Um, is it important to you that readers have a knowledge of history uh, after they've read the books, your books? Well, I, I know that in particular isn't important to me because I'm, I'm not in the education world. Mm. Of course, novels do educate us, but that's not my main purpose. My main purpose is is to draw the reader into 
the world that I've imagined. And that world has to seem real. So if I'm writing about, as in the evening and the morning, writing about um, the period around the year 1000, then in order to make the story seem real to people, I have to put in details about what life was like. I have to put in what they ate and what they wore what their houses were like and what their boats were like and what their relationships were with other people, their neighbors. They have, obviously in, in, in the, the village that becomes Kingsbridge, they, they have priests, there are priests in the village, there are slaves, uh, there are more wealthy people and very poor people. And and all of these relationships have to be in the story for it to be convincing to readers. It has to seem real because then, if it seems real, the reader finds it easier to feel the emotions of the characters. You can't, you, you can have a sad, you have a something bad happen and you want the reader to feel sad about it. But it's not going to feel sad if the surroundings don't seem real. If it looks as if it's happened in a fairy tale, mm. then it's very difficult for the reader to share the emotions. If it's happened in a situation which feels real to the reader, then the reader will feel the emotion. And that really is, I think, that's what we enjoy in a story. When we mm. feel the emotions, we feel, we feel scared because something bad might be about to happen. Or we feel sad because somebody has been uh, unlucky. Or, or we feel angry because a character like Bishop Winston in the evening and the morning is such a nasty bully. And we get angry. And as, as Esben says, we say, why don't you kill that bastard? And that's, <laughs> that's the, see, that's the emotion I want you to feel. Mm. Because I, I know that when the reader feels emotions, the reader is enjoying the story. Mm, mm. True, true. So uh, I'm going to go into a, a little bit uh, thing, uh, a little bit spicy, because we hear about daily life and how they lived and what they ate and what they wore. Uh, but we also hear about how they love and about their sex life in in your books. Um, are these? Do you feel, Cam, that these uh, parts of the book or the stories are something just necessary to write, or or do we actually enjoy writing them? Well, both. I enjoy <laughs> writing them, uh, and I think they. Uh, I think um, you see. Let's take two people who are in love. Okay, mm. now. If they if they meet and fall in love and get married and live happily ever after, that's not a story. Mm. Okay, that's nobody wants to read that one. What we want to read is Romeo and Juliet. They meet, they fall in love, they want to be together and they can't. They're forbidden. It's not allowed. And then, so in 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 most love stories, there's a period when the two people are looking at one another across a crowded room and wishing they could be together, wishing they could kiss and touch. And they can't, it's not allowed. So that emotion, now that's that's a tension in the story. And the reader feels that tension and looks forward to a resolution. And the resolution of that love story is that the two people go to bed together. And in the modern world, everybody knows that two people actually getting into bed isn't the end. <laughs> there are many things that can happen after they've taken their clothes off. <laughs> things can go wrong. One person can turn out to be unkind. I mean, we all know, don't we, at least all of us over the age of about 16 know that the best way to really get to know a person's character is to go to bed with them. That's when they really reveal themselves. <laughs> so, so for me, you know, I, I love Victorian fiction. I love fiction novels from the last, from the century before last. 19th century authors, uh, uh, um, English and French and Russian, 
I love them. But there's one thing that they can't do because the, the rules were against it. They can't show you that moment. Mm. So, for example, one of the most famous English novels is called Middlemarch by George Eliot. And it's about a young woman who foolishly marries an older man who's really a, who's really unemotional and cold. And they go on their honeymoon. They go to Rome and we see them. And we're wondering what happened? <laughs> what happened when they went to bed? This this <laughs> this old guy who's really not interested in anything except old monuments and old manuscripts. And this fabulous young woman who's been so all her friends told her not to marry him and she married him anyway. <laughs> then what happened? Of course, you never know because it's a Victorian novel. And but today we can do that. We, it's no longer banned for us to tell that part of the story. I think it's an important part of the story. And here's the other thing. If the reader has been waiting for hundreds of pages <laughs> for this to happen, it's really a, an enjoyable part of the story. So that's why I think it's important. <laughs> <laughs> Very enjoyable in the story, but Espen, is it as enjoyable to to read? How how is it to read these uh, these scenes? Oh, um, I I slow down inside and. Um, And I often have to to re redo the takes. <laughs> um, I remember getting an email from uh, somebody who listened to to uh, ex uh, especially that part driving a car, and she wrote to me. I had to to to, to take the car uh, to stop the car and to listen for ten <laughs> minutes, and and then because and I I yeah that was really nice uh, 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 reading. Um, that she was happy about uh, oh, it's a, your it's a, your your words and and the way that I. It's a great I, compliment I to both of us. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So so car. Ken can actually make you blush or what? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah. yes. And sometimes I have to stop because I'm crying, uh, and you can hear it uh, in my oh. voice. So I have to go back and and yeah, oh. yeah. Uh, I experienced that as well. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we we I have lots of questions, Ken, but we're running out of time. So I'm just want to wrap up here and uh, to go back to the start where you say you listen to audiobooks in in your car. What is the latest audiobook you have listened to? Oh. <laughs> well, um, it's uh, it's one of my own. <laughs> yes. It's at, I've been listening to Eye of the Needle in French. Wow. La Maloy. I'll show you. I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. Right. And the reader is called Philippe Résimont. Uh -huh. Philippe Résimont. Yeah. And you know, I wrote that book um, 44 years ago. Whoa. Uh, and so it's kind of strange. Mm. I was 27. And I'm 71 now. It's like a, a different. It's like a different person wrote this, right. <laughs> you know. And but I'm so proud that this is new. This has just come out. The audio book in French has just come out. I'm just so pleased that something I wrote when I was almost a kid, you know, um, is still being um, published in new and different forms. So it's a. It, It's a joy to me to listen to it because it's it says something so nice about you know my my very old work mm. and um, uh, it, it's flattering to me and um, I'm so happy that that readers are still experiencing these books that I wrote when I was in my 20s. Could you ever go back to writing spy spy thrillers uh, again? Oh yeah. Um, Um, they wouldn't be the same. There, there's something about Eye of the Needle. There, there is something about it. Uh, you know, that in a creative person's life, there's often a moment when things come very easily. You think, you know, for composers and and um, uh, rock musicians, a certain stage of their life, they just keep writing one hit after another. Number one hits one after the other. And 
you know, the way the Beatles did in the 60s and the Rolling Stones and so on. And for me, writing Eye of the Needle was so easy. It was like run, running downhill. And I knew it was good. It's my first success. And I knew it was 10 times as good as anything I'd written before. I'd written many novels before, which were not successful. And I knew, and it just kept coming. I had three weeks holiday from my job. I, I worked for a publisher. And I wrote most of Eye of the Needle in that three weeks. And now it takes wow. me three years. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are looking forward to, or I am at least, uh, looking forward to your next book already, you know, uh, even though I've just finished listening to the evening and the morning. So thank you for being with us today. Ken, it was a, a, really a pleasure talking to you. And uh, Espen, do you want to, yeah? No, yeah. Just thank, thank show you. the prize. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a pleasure talking to you both. And uh, Esben, thanks for doing a great job. And, and um, I'm so happy that uh, you and I won this prize together. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> thank you. Big congrats. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.